Anyway, here's my office. You can't get in. This is all the 1620 cards for filing cabinets or for cabinets with 20 trays per cabinet. Uh, they're all labeled. We'll go through them. And, oh, wow. And on top were boxes going almost to the ceiling. And I got sighted on that. The fire department told you? The fire marshal told me the fact that this was a hazard and uh, I had moved to another office and we'll see that shortly. And then off over here are some more boxes and I've gone through some but I've not gone through all of them. So there's 1620, IBM 1620 manuals and software here. There's also some other computers that we use here at the university. Uh, we use uh, digital equipment, DEC VAXs, VAX 11780. Uh, of course, those are all gone. And now we have digital DEC Alpha 2100s, and we mm -hmm. use the BMS operating system, amongst other things. So I'm going to make my way through here. And as you know, the van is coming this Thursday, right? June uh, 26, I believe. Yeah, I got an email from DAG uh, okay. indicating that it was on its way from okay. uh, so, the NSA. So what I like to do, and tell me if the format's correct, mm -hmm. kind of go through these drawers and let me point out some of the highlights okay that'd be very good and uh, let you record you close the door we'll move this what I want to do is before we get started here could you just tell us a little bit about your background and how you got involved with the 1620 and okay. uh, I'm an engineer by trade I have a uh, bachelor's and a master's degree from Purdue University Lafayette in chemical engineering and when I got my master's I left and went to work for Douglas Aircraft Company uh, at that time, they were in Santa Monica, California. So I worked there in uh, 1958, all of 59, and in January of 1960, I left Douglas Aircraft and uh, I went back to Purdue Lafayette to get my PhD in engineering, but this time it was in mechanical engineering, not uh, chemical. And all that time, while I was in engineering, I would, minored in what we now formally call computer science. Uh, we didn't have a computer science label, it was all math. And so I took Fortran and machine level language and all those things that were popular in that era. And when I graduated out of uh, Purdue University with my uh, PhD in uh, mechanical engineering, of course I had a minor, which today we would call computer science. And I went to work for American Oil Company in Whiting, Indiana. And uh, when I arrived, I was assigned to a 1620-1710 project. And uh, that computer system controlled in real time a ultraformer. And an ultraformer is a device that takes uh, crude oil, distills it, and makes high-octane gasoline. And uh, we were one of the early pioneers in this area, in fact, in the nation, to put a computer in closed loop to control a uh, ultraformer in a refinery. So that's how I got into the uh, 1620 arena. And uh, one thing led to another, and uh, in the fall, which is in the summer of 1963, the uh, director of this campus, Dr. Elliott, contacted me through our course, mutual correspondence, and he offered me a position to head up what we, uh, what they started as a new, brand new department uh, called Computer Technology. And when I arrived, there was a 1620 already purchased, but nobody had turned it on and nobody knew how to operate it, unfortunately. And, and what uh, year and that, was that? That was no, uh, 60... 1963. So mm -hmm. I arrived on campus uh, in uh, September 1963. And, of course, I had finished uh, my uh, employment at that time with American Oil. So I had been here on this campus since the fall of 1963. I've put in over 35 years. Mm -hmm. So the 1620 was here from the summer of 1963 all the way to late, late uh, 1979, 1980 in that time frame, somewhere there. And then it, uh, of course, was phased out uh, with other equipment. But we used that equipment to train our two-year and four-year students in a program called Computer Technology, but today it's called Information Systems. And the emphasis was uh, programming, uh, systems analysis and design. And, operating systems. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got involved with the 1620 and it's been a, it's a very good machine. I, I recommend it highly for beginners. It's a very easy machine. 
and you could go on and build up and go to other platforms very easily. Today we don't have that luxury, so uh, today, as you know, it's all point and click, and unfortunately, uh, you miss something when you teach in that style. Uh, the students in those days had a 1620 with nothing in it. In other words, they cleared core and they had to write some machine level language routines to bootstrap them, bootstrap their programs, and we'll go through some of them uh, today. From, from the console, they would just enter uh, instructions from the console. Yeah, either through the console or through punch cards. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, first, we made them do some simple things like 8080 reproduce or read a card and print it on the uh, console typewriter. And then later do arithmetic, they discovered they needed the add and multiply tables. And so we taught them those concepts. And then later uh, they found out they could alter those tables, the add and multiply tables, and turn this into an octo machine or a uh, binary machine. And uh, we'll share some of that as we go on tonight or today. Uh, the 1620 that you had, was it a Model 1 or a Model 2, no. or did you do any upgrades? Yeah, it was a Model uh, 120K. And it had no printer or no disk drives. It's a traditional um, 1620 card card I/O. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's no hard drives, uh, no printer, and so uh, for a good number of years, that's the way it remained. And uh, we never upgraded it to 40k or 60k. It still remained at 20k. And then when the administration did decided to do grading scheduling uh, of students. Uh, they did upgrade it and put a hard drive first, uh, IBM 1311, which was 2 million bytes or 2 million characters in those days. And then the f uh, later they further upgraded it and put a IBM 1443 printer. And so, uh, so you did have an inter uh, printer on your 16. Yeah, we had a printer. And when we go through some of the software, you'll see some subtle differences between uh, card I.O. and then having disks and then having printers. So, so originally, students would get their output on cards, yes. and they'd run it through an interpreter. Yeah, we'd run it through an interpreter, and run it through a 4 or 7 accounting machine, mm -hmm. and print it. And so we had a whole complement of uh, unit record equipment, and we'll show you some angles later. Uh, they had key punches, uh, they had a, an 082 sorter, that had an IBM 514 reproducing punch, uh, they had an IBM 085 collator, and they had an IBM 548 interpreter and an IBM 407 accounting machine. Mm -hmm. So all that was used to really support the 1620. And uh, that's the way kids did their data processing. That's when, when I first used the 1620 at UT Arlington, we had no uh, printer. And so we had to run, to just do all, yeah, right, do everything to the 407. The uh, folks in the computer center didn't want the console typewriter going out, so they had disabled the output to the console <laughs> typewriter. <laughs> So that students couldn't, uh, uh, since we have both a Model 1 and a Model 2, mm -hmm. and so they uh, didn't want that the console typewriter being used, so they disabled that. That's, that's interesting. Uh, now the students here, in terms of languages, they learn uh, the 1620 machine level language. Uh, they learn how to program in SPS, which is nothing more than the assembly level language of the 1620. Mm -hmm. Then they progressed to a language called GoTran, which is really a subset of Fortran. It only had 12 instructions. Uh, it's a it was a load and go type of thing. It was a an interpreter primarily. And then after that, they programmed in Fortran. Uh, first, it was Fortran with format. With, I'm sorry, it's Fortran one with format, and then later it got upgraded to uh, Fortran, where we could use the disk drive and the printer. Mm -hmm. and, and the compilers and the assemblers at that time resided on the disk. Uh, prior to our upgrade, everything was cards, including the assembler and the compilers. Right, you just preloaded. Preloaded, and so that's why we needed all the unit record equipment to support this, because just about every student had its own GoTran interpreter, you know, mm -hmm. carrying it, or its own Fortran DEX, uh, and so that's the way they did business, so to speak. And we had all the master DEX uh, stored up here and we made a duplicate of the master Dex and had another set downstairs. So if anything got damaged, we could always go to our backup, and that's why you see all this backup there. Right. So this is our primary backup that's been uh, that was used for a good number of years. Good. Well, what do we have here? Okay. Let's go through that. Uh, when the, the uh, mover comes, I'm going to label these one, two, three, four. This will be the first thing 
uh, finally Kevin you should look at then this would be the second this should be the third and this would be the fourth so I'll have mm -hmm. some numbers here but if you notice uh, on the outside you'll notice uh, we have numeric numbers uh, all this the, all these trays are from the IBM 1620 users group at that time currently it's called common all right and what people did in those days was to donate programs to the users group and uh, the users then from time to time got a publication from IBM indicating what was donated mm -hmm. and so uh, I went ahead and got certain routines that I thought we needed here I didn't get the complete set but you can see uh, our, our, the uh, programs that were donated encompass this cabinet and part of this and so if we look at the uh, first tray, you'll notice right off the bat that there, a, by the way, notice the decimal system they use, it always starts with zero something, so in this case zero point, and then there is another number, in this case two point, and then there was a usually a three decimal digit, so this was their convention, and uh, this happens to be a GoTran um, uh, interpreter uh, from the Air Force Academy, AF was the Air Force Academy, and that was used for a few years here at the university until we upgraded. And in fact, why don't I do this? There you go. And uh, what what I've done is I've gone ahead and kept the masters here, so these are nice and clean. This was some sort of editor yeah, nice. that they had, and they've been preserved and under air, in an air conditioned uh, room primarily. Everything's been. Uh, compact and uh, the air has been squeezed down so is the moisture. So here we have certain routines. This one was uh, Fortran Mark Sense card decoder. Uh, what people were also trying to do is have students Mark Sense their Fortran programs and punch cards and uh, have them process through the 514 Mark Sense reader and then this guy would pick it up and translate into holes. We tried it a little bit, but didn't work too well. So instead of them key punching, they would do they, the mark, mark sense. sensing at home. That's yeah, something different. Uh, we tried at other universities were trying just to get some productivity out of the students. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of them have sample uh, data that goes with them that always indicated to us it was working, if not. Over here was one of our workhorses. You'll notice this is called PDQ Fortran pretty damn quick Fortran. Uh, we used the IBM Fortran 1 uh, compiler and we'll show you that later but uh, a fellow at uh, one of the uh, electric power utilities in uh, Pennsylvania and his group did this and donated it and so this was a production oriented Fortran processor that was used here for a number of years much uh, much more efficient and a lot of fast throughput uh, using PDQ Fortran than the uh, uh, IBM one that we had. Uh, these others uh, that I'm pointing here, this was uh, a reproducer that imitated the 514, some of the 514 functions. And we, the 514 was? Uh, the, the IBM 514 reproducing punch. We okay. didn't use that. We tried it and it wasn't uh, quite what we wanted, so I left it in there. But this guy was the workhorse, PD, PDQ Fortran. And what uh, do you remember what utility that was from? Uh, Which one, the PDQ? Yeah. Uh, what electric utility? Or, uh, uh, when we get to the documentation, we'll see the guy's name. Okay. Yeah, it, it's in the documentation. By the way, all these manuals uh, have backup documentation. They're not here; they're offsite, and I'll show it to you when okay. we okay. when we get there to it. So uh, we not only used it here; other universities used it, especially for those who work card oriented and card bound. Okay, so. You'll notice uh, all of them at that time came with a processor, subroutines, and some uh, data decks, etc. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me put this guy back in. There we go. Okay, this is a continuation of PDQ Fortran. Now, PDQ Fortran eventually led to an operating system called C4D, an operating system built around PD, PDQ uh, Fortran. Uh, we didn't use it here. I toyed with the idea of using it, but uh, we had um, fairly good experience with the one that was supplied by IBM. So we didn't use it, although the universities used it. So I, I simply let it here. Uh, so this is something 
uh, yeah. to use accordingly in, in, in place of the IBM oper uh, Monitor One operating system. And CD or C4D was developed uh, where? Uh, by the fellow uh, from Pennsylvania and also some others. And when we get to the okay. documentation, we'll see. I can't recall from memory uh, what these are. Uh, this was uh, another program called Wizzo. I didn't use it here. One of my uh, colleagues ordered it. Uh, he read the documentation after he ordered it and says uh, he, he didn't see any need to use it, so I <laughs> left it in there. <laughs> so it's been no, there that's good. So, so, you know, you, you buy these things and you use them. Uh, or as you get these things, you use them accordingly. Uh, these were used in our computer math classes. Let me start at the top. Uh, this was the evaluation of a determinant on the 1620. Uh, we made uh, samples of these and passed them out to students, and students would fe feed in uh, their data. So we had a computer math class that used these. Another one was simultaneous linear equations. This was contributed by uh, a user, and again, it escapes me. And so we would have students solve a 4x4, four four, a 10x10, 10 10, a 12x12 12 12 uh -huh. using this algorithm. Uh, this was another uh, uh, contributed program, Solution of Simultaneous Linear Equations. Notice this is uh, 5.0007, this is 08. And so somebody else donated it. So we used this, and I think we got better mileage out of this version than this one. And. Uh, if you look over here, this is the contributed one from the 1620 users group, and this was a reproduced one that was used downstairs as our backup, and from this they made their, the students made their copies. This was ordered by our engineering department to solve eigenvalues, and uh, we didn't use it in our program, but our engineers used it uh, to do their eigenvalue problems. It sounds like the 1620 was used by a lot more than just the computer technology exactly, right. uh, department. Yeah, uh, the computer technology department was the primary user, but engineering uh, used it also, and the math department to a degree used it. Mm -hmm. So we had the math department also using it. Uh, here's another routine solving simultaneous linear equations. Uh, I did, uh, somebody else had ordered that, and I just kept the deck, and they used that, and I don't know what the uh, status was. Here's one dealing with Bessel functions. Somebody from our math department uh, ordered the computation of Bessel functions. I didn't use it, but they did. And then we have some cold start cards that uh, got into here. But that's all right. Uh, cold start cards enable you, obviously, to bring up the operating system or the monitor system when you were using that. Now, most of these uh, decks, are they in uh, machine language? Uh, are they in GoTran okay, or the, combination? Yeah, the majority of these decks are what we call in machine form, object form. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also have the source code. When I say source code, we either have the GoTran code or the Fortran code or the SPS assembly level language code. Okay, but the, and, the, and the documentation they sent me, the, in most cases the authors included the source code. Mm -hmm. So I so I have a paper copy of the source code, and we'll see it at the other side. Is it the original shareware. Yeah, the original. <laughs> is that what it was? Yeah, it was on paper. <laughs> uh, again, uh, notice the mathematical routine: solution of homogeneous and non-homogeneous simultaneous linear equations. Uh, math department used these. I didn't use these. Uh, crop reduction. We used these here, so did the math department. So here was a way to solve simultaneous linear equations through the crop reduction method. This was pretty efficient. This one dealt with inversion of matrices uh, using Jordan's technique. I didn't use it, the math department used it. Uh, there was some subroutines that we could attach to Kraut's routine, they're over here. And then this was a disk-oriented equation solver. Um, I did not use this. Uh, we had ordered it, and I don't know if it ever again, if the math department ever used this or not, but uh, this was, uh, again, solving simultaneous linear equations. Uh, notice the number jumps from 37 to 40. This was another one uh, to solve simultaneous linear equations. Notice it's called Moses Maximum One Pass Simultaneous Linear Equation. Again, contribute another university. I didn't use it, but we kept them here in case we needed uh, uh, additional software or additional routines. Now, when you would order these, uh, this, uh, this software would come through the users group guide. Right. right. And... Um, Kind of what was the organizational structure? How did that happen? It, was it 
did, was there a central repository like at Purdue, you would have responsibility for this particular routine and people would order it from you, or was there a central place okay. that people would go? Okay, first of all, when uh, I joined Common back in the early 60s, uh, they shipped out immediately to me uh, the so-called ordering form. The ordering form were in the form of cards, and on the cards was the... Uh, ID number of the program and a brief title and when anybody would call me and say hey, do you have a routine to solve simultaneous linear equations I'd look in my index and I would maybe over the phone tell them what it were and if we agreed on a certain algorithm like Krauts I would pull that card out mail it to the 1620 uh, users group in Mechanicsburg Pennsylvania they would immediately punch it up and within a couple of weeks I would get the deck back now, normally what I did was I would stack these up, so I not only had requests from math department, but from engineering myself. And so I would send a bunch of cards. Do a batch. Do a batch. And then I would get uh, a humongous carton. Uh, here's, some, here's some original cartons that came from the IBM 1620 users group. Uh, I've emptied them, but they've got other programs which I need to file. And so usually a carton contained a total of five of these boxes and each box held 2,000 cards mm -hmm. okay so these are original 2,000 cards and so you can imagine them being in a box uh, upright in fact when they were delivered they were, they were delivered upright. vertically yeah, yeah. Stacked vertically and so what I would do is I would pull them out and the thing that would be on there would be strictly the numeric number that I'm pointing to none mm -hmm. of this el none of nothing else was written and so my secretary and my lab assistant would write the title and whether it was an object duck or a source program. Okay. And then from that we would reproduce one set and put it in a computer center. The original would come up here, so to speak, or mm -hmm. to, to to this. And that's how we went ahead and ordered them. Okay, so uh, that was the way we proceeded. And uh, if you look over here, uh, this is essentially so far that we've entered the mathematical routines that are used. And if we go down to the uh, other area here, uh, we have a uh, correlation routine. This I got from the 1620 users group. So now we're entering the statistical analysis uh, arena. Frequency distributions, uh, more statistics routine. Now, uh, these were primarily used by the math department. I didn't use them. And then we have some more analysis. Here was a routine. Uh, this was a plot subroutine for Fortran with format. In other words, if you had an IBM, I'm sorry, if you had a plotter attached to your 1620, and in those days it was a Calcom plotter. We had one of those okay. in history center. In history, okay. What you could do is take the uh, this deck together with the uh, Fortran compiler from IBM, and you were able to direct the uh, Calcom. Mm -hmm. A lot to do some plotting. We didn't have a Calcom thing, so I just left it here. I thought at one time the engineers would order, but we never got around to that. Uh, and then up here uh, are some more uh, math-oriented, statistically-oriented programs. You notice these are pristine white, which means we didn't use them. We ordered them, but they sat here. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I can't tell you much about this guy. Now, moving down to the next tray. And by the way, when this thing is shipped, it'll be shipped exactly like you see it. Here we have some more mathematical routines. Uh, these are, this is to, uh, this is Simpson's rule for uh, solving uh, integrals and so forth. And so our math department used that. Here's another routine to do an XY plot. And again, if you had a plot plotter, you could do this. Uh, I don't know if this one allowed plotting on a printer. Uh, it could be, but we didn't use it. You know, it's all pure mm -hmm. white, and we didn't use it. Uh, Fortran 2. Yeah, here's a Fortran 2D. The D stands, this is a disk version of Fortran, subroutines uh, for matrix inversion. And so our math department used this. Uh, here's a another set of decks for plotting. Notice this is a printer plotting subroutine algorithm. Uh, since our oh, printer... So we would do it on the on a printer. On the printer, uh, but we didn't use this either for some reason. Uh, moving on, there's some more plot routines here, Fortran, uh, source deck. Uh, we, our engineering department, we have, we have a civil engineering department. I did order these 
And unfortunately, the fellow who was supposed to use these um, got involved with other projects. So all this is for civil engineering. Notice inverse geotetic position computations. He never used them, so they sat here. Apparently, there were quite a. F the 1620 was used in a fair amount of uh, civil engineering type exactly. applications. Yeah. There was a lot of software for civil engineers, and a lot of civil engineering firms would have a 1620. I believe Dave Weiss's machine, he's the fella in Portland mm -hmm. who has a 1620 that's operational today. That machine came at some point in its life, it lived at a civil engineering firm. Okay. I don't know if he got it from there mm -hmm. or before the university got it. Okay. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Yeah. So uh, I know uh, it was strong in engineering, the 1620. Anyway, uh, th this is, these are civil engineering applications mm -hmm. not used. However, we did use these. This is a routine to compute the adiabatic flame temperature with no dissociation. I use this myself because uh, if you're a chemical engineer or a mechanical engineer with combustion experience, uh, you would use this to compute adiabatic flame temperatures, and this was a decent routine. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I did use this, and we got the documentation in now, my office. Was all this software available so that uh, if you were a member of the user group, uh, you would pay your dues, I assume, right. to the to the user group? Could you just order any of this software, or was there a charge for like? Re to cover the cost of reproducing no, the it, it was all free. It was okay. all free. Uh, you got to remember, at that time, IBM was bundled. In other words, when they saw you a system, uh, that was it. And uh, when I ordered this, I didn't pay anything other than you know the going to meetings and paying my uh, registration fees. So and, th and this was very a very good deal. The 1620 user group itself uh, was that run by IBM or was it just a group of users? Well, no, IBM participated, but the uh, and they did have people on the board, but the majority of the board were users. Mm -hmm. um, but IBM did a lot of the uh, promotional uh, work and a lot of the work behind the scenes. And of course, IBM used it to announce new products there and bring uh, new models. I remember when the 1620 Model 2 was announced at one of the users meeting up in Chicago. IBM brought a 1620 Model 2 and demonstrated, and I got to see it. Mm -hmm. and so that was, uh, you know, they came in with the users group. Okay, uh, moving on. Uh, notice now we're in the engineering realm. This th this is a uh, deck for thermodynamic functions. I ordered it for our engineering department. Unfortunately, they didn't use it, so it sat here. Computation of equilibrium composition and temperatures for chemical reaction. I had ordered it for both the chem chemistry department and for engineering department. They didn't use it, so it sits here. Uh, simultaneous uh, equations and matrix inversion of complex variables, the math department used that. And this one is a 1620 multi curve plotting program. This was using the printer, and we did use this. Okay. So some of these I recognized accordingly. Moving on, you'll notice now we get into LP, linear programming. So our math department, and we use some of these accordingly. So here are routines for linear programming contributed by different version, uh, different uh, users. And you'll notice the number uh, goes up 02, 06, 07, 08. So this, these are a variety of contributions. And it was just a matter of who uh, wanted to, who, who felt most comfortable with, and this is how these developed. You notice this area is untouched, so nobody used it, but these mm -hmm. uh, were used accordingly. And when you see 1 slash 3, 2 slash 3, uh, that means that uh, these came in three batches to us, and that's, uh, how, we, okay. that's how we uh, got it. And generally we have markings, so if they get out of order, you can pretty well put it together with the markings. Uh, let me ask you a question, just cards. Um, it, it looks like from reading the labels, we have some system programs, some right. math routines, and so right. forth. Yeah, you, you, um, yeah, right here is all by various uh, yeah, disciplines. I was, yeah, I was just thinking maybe instead of going system. through each little okay. deck, well, that we just kind of go through some gross overview. Yeah, why don't we do then, a gross uh, overview? That'd be good. All right, uh, so what we're going to do is we've gone through about half of this. Mm -hmm. Let's jump over here and give you some of the more interesting things. First of all, I've enclosed blind cards. You follow me? Oh, good. These are blind cards. So when you use the system, here's some in red, white, blue, orange. Here's our 
Well, that's, that's the same thing over here. For those of us doing Fortran, we had our Fortran decks. You see that? Mm -hmm. For those of us doing uh, SPS, 1620 Assembler, we oh, had these. Oh, very nice. Uh, these are general purpose cards from IBM. I think these are general purpose. Oh, this was another way. We would have different styles of cards depending if the student's a beginner or advanced. They had to also know the Hollerith code, so you'll notice uh, the, how the alphabet is arranged here. So, mm -hmm. so this is for the these were for beginners. So when they key punch, they could look at the hose and kind of interpret them on the fly what they were. Uh, okay, general purpose. So these are all general purpose cards or specific purpose cards, depending what it is. And we had colors, as you know, to deduce color coded. Color -coded. This was our way of doing things. Uh, here's the experiment we tried. Oops, let me backtrack. This oh, is the, the experiment, mark, sense. uh, mark sensing. Uh, you'll notice over here, if they wanted to put a comment, they bubbled the word comment. If they wanted to do an if statement, they bubbled the if. If they wanted to do an n, they bubbled the n. The do was bubbled here. Punch was bubbled here. So this is a Fortran oriented mark sense thing. And we tried it and yeah, the kids took it home. They did this, but after a while, they found out it was faster to keep punch than to bubble it in. <laughs> so what they would do is they bubble it in and then they go into the IBM 14 uh, reproducing punch which had, which had mark sense brushes would pick it up and punch the holes there. And if the deck was small and the machine was working, that would be great. But Sometimes the reproducer failed, and we got all sorts of mispunches. And so that uh, experiment we tried so at other universities and uh, uh, productivity improvement it, type thing. Yeah, but then they got bored, and then they decided to keep on. So uh. this is how we did Fortran for a while, and uh, it was unique. And uh, this was developed at some u university, Tennessee Tech. You notice not uh, down over here. I'm pointing Tennessee Tech Fortran statement coding card. Uh, I went to a user group, one of the professors talked about it from Tennessee Tech, and it says, hey, why don't we try it? So that's I have I never heard of that. That's very that interesting. Yeah. And uh, you had to have a 514 reproducing punch with Mark Sensing to pick this guy up. And uh, we also did a lot of grading, a lot of uh, test grading and quizzes, quizzes, and so we had students mark their quiz questions, and I noticed uh, these go from 18 to 27, and they were done by someone else. So I picked this thing up. And so if you wanted to give a simple uh, five-question, ten-question, true-false, multiple choice, here's what you could use. And we did this for a long time until we got a scanner uh, that we could use with another system. So this is how we did short quizzes and uh, exams. We got mm -hmm. multiple copies. So you have now some punch cards which you don't find too much these days and uh, I'm not sure if there's anyone even manufacturing yeah, uh, punch cards yeah, anymore. They don't make, yeah, I, I, uh, I know what, cards. Yeah, the Hollerith cards and uh, those are rare and by the way the, these came in, in boxes like this mm -hmm. so these were the originals so anyway you got a bunch of blanks. Oh good. Alright we have games and demos. Alright let's show you what we got for games and demos. First of all, kids like to print up when we got our printer or our county machine. Happy New Year stuff. If you had an, uh, a routine that read cards and printed them, this guy did it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so here's Happy New Year. Here comes Santa Claus with a sleigh, and here's Merry Christmas. Here's Happy Easter, and this is a generation of a woman. So if you had either an accounting machine or an, or a routine to read cards and print them on the on the 1443 printer, fine. And here's Happy Easter. Now this is an interesting, this is a one-armed bandit. You feed this in and it will simulate uh, a, uh, a slot machine. And so it has a random number generator and it generates some unique characters and you could play one-armed bandit. This is a neon light program. It was developed by one of the fellows who worked here at Gary Austin. And this is interesting. I think I told you about this on the phone. It says, neon lights, switch choose on, load the arithmetic tables. Now notice what it says, type in, type in, letter, type in a letter followed by a record mark and RS. What was that? Reset? I forget. The letter is displayed on the MAR register. You see that? Ah. So whatever so you like typed a, in. B, yeah, C. exactly. So this was a, a primitive way of visually displaying something on the console lights. 
And so, since it's a very thin program, and with these days when you get your 6020 up there running it, that would be a good program try it, to yeah, uh, try it, uh, see what happens. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of RS. Is that reset or something? Or is that there's return and start? Ah, I think it's return and start. Type in a letter followed by a record mark and return and start, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, that, you would guys that would make sense, yeah. Okay, so that. Uh, okay, there was a manufacturer's demo. I didn't use this, somebody else used that. Uh, some of these demos I didn't use. And if you wanted to uh, print signs, like big letters yeah, and such. This guy did it on the oh, 1620. Okay. <laughs> so he did a sign. Every computer center had one computer of those. Every computer center. This was contributed by Professor Dolphin at, uh, at our Indianapolis campus. Um, we have a combined Indiana University, Purdue University campus. And this was a demo in 1967. He gave it to me, and I can't recall what it did. We used it for a while, but uh, I don't recall what it did. So you guys will have to do that. There was a bunch of tic-tac-toe problems, programs. So TTT is tic-tac-toe, and these were, uh, these are variations that our students did. As you know, the algorithm for tic-tac-toe has been published, so what they would do is get the flowchart form mm -hmm. encoded either in Fortran or assembly level language. So here we had a student, Perry Schmidt, a student, Alan Genvey, a student named Mr. Dreyer, Miss Finley, Mr. Crowder, uh, code these various variations very interesting. Some, of course, cheated. <laughs> so, so this is interesting. This is a baseball simulation routine. What this routine did on the 1620, by the way, this is the machine level language form. I don't have the source. It was contributed by a user, so you'll notice the user uh, uh, number. Uh, it had some of the old time baseball players stored. I think it had uh, 50 players stored. So it would ask you to choose nine. And of course, you had a list of these. And after you chose nine players, it would choose nine. And then using a random number generator, it would generate a baseball game. Very interesting. You see, uh, you see mm -hmm. the output coming out on the uh, typewriter, the console typewriter. Ah, uh, interesting. Yeah, so this was an interesting. So you got a few that you could feed in to try your machine. Others are strictly listings, you know, just mm -hmm. feed it in and list of cards and out comes something. Okay, let's go into Boy. the systems routines. Uh, you'll notice here, we're, we're using 1620, 1443 monitor. In other words, what we're saying is uh, when we upgraded to a, uh, a disk drive, 1311 disk drive and a printer, we had to get some new routines here. So here, here are the routines for the monitor and something called system table, something called disk utility program, something called a supervisor. And with the with the operating system with the monitor, you got a new uh, assembler. This was called SPS 2D. The D meant is the disk version. Mm -hmm. The SPS means it's the uh, it's the assembler that we use. And uh, th these dealt with the subroutines. Here's the SPS uh, processor, and this was the supervisor that was used with monitor. Uh, they are in the way they came to us, and you'll notice these decks are number. This is deck two, deck three, deck four five, six, seven, etc. So this mm -hmm. is the way they shipped it to us, this way we have it. Now, that takes care of, of the assembler and the operating system, but here's the Fortran processor. So you notice this is Fortran 2 disk version. And so uh, notice this is a processor, this is some sort of loader deck. These are all the subroutines that Fortran supported. And so they came in various options with sets. Option A sets 1 and 2, sets three and four and so forth. And then it came in with some sample programs that you could run. Okay, and these are also numbered, I noticed. Yeah, they're There's all numbered. Decade, yeah, yeah. nine, De exactly. 11. Exactly, and uh, so these are now some system uh, utilities. So this was our the earliest operating system with the disk and a printer. And you'll notice this was modification level three. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, this thing gets updated and every so often. So I didn't keep all the updates. I kept the last one. The last one is modification 12, so I've got the last. Okay, so the one we just saw was the mod 3. 3, this is mod 12. 12, which was the last one released by IBM. Yeah, and this is the, the last one that we were using. So you'll notice the same scenario. This is the monitor 1 system. Uh, some SPS subroutines over here. SPS processor, 
some sort of supervisor. So it's following what we have up here. And then here's all the Fortran with the processor, the subroutines, and some sample programs, etc. So whatever you saw up here is reflected downstairs, except the mod level went from 3 to 12. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, now, so that meant that IBM did 12 mods of the system software yeah, for the 6 yeah, and 20. Yeah, and I only have 3 and 12, and yeah, that's, the rest, yeah, that's, who knows. Now, before, so you notice this was our latest uh, version that we were running, but before we even got our disk and our printer, we were card RO, as I explained earlier. So, card, card card. so here's my card, Fortran card processor. The kid fed this in, or the student fed this in. For their program. Before their program, then their program came next, and it went ahead and did the translation. If the student called upon a sine routine or a cosine, you had to feed this in. Right. It told you to do it. This was some sort of precompiler. Uh, they used it to check for errors. So uh -huh. there was a precompiler, a processor, and the subroutines. And this was, some of these students carried these around. You know, <laughs> of course, uh, we allowed that sort of thing, and uh, they could only run it here. Uh, there were no, uh, right. there were sixteen twenties, but they were in industry. Uh, they couldn't get in. Now we also had the GoTran interpreter, the card version. So mm -hmm. we use this. And I think uh, what I had. This is the original, and this is a copy of this. Of this is mod level five. So uh, the bulk of our processing, either in GoTran or Fortran, were card oriented. Okay. Over here, and I think that's probably the way it was. I just remember the the sixteen twenties at UT Arlington, where I went to school. We had a Model One, mm -hmm. uh, which was all card oriented. It was. It would be nice if somebody would come in and preload the Fortran compiler <laughs> slash operating system uh, for you before you came and ran your programs. Yeah. And the thing that was nice. And the reason that we preferred to use the Model 2 was it had a disk drive, so you okay. didn't have to fool. Yeah, with these did not. So you could see the inefficiencies. And, yeah. And that's why you saw some of these students, they'd have a card out of order, or it'd get messed up or eaten, and so they'd lose time. Right. Okay, now, this is Fortran Gotran Card.io. Card this is now the uh, uh, 1620 SPS Card.io, so we had some sample programs and sample problems. Here's the SPS subroutines, here's the SPS processor, all in cards, you follow me? Mm -hmm. So this is our assembler, and this is a, uh, let's see, yeah, this is an assembler, and this is another, I think this is a duplicate, Let me. See. yeah, this is a duplicate of what we have here. So this was, when I arrived here, this is what we were using, these were the cards. When we finally retired the machine, we were using these up here, this is mod level 12. Right. Okay, so you're seeing some of the history right in here. And you had the disk drive, you had upgraded to the disk drive, so you had the, yeah, the okay. D versions yeah. and so forth. Now, these dealt with some of the IBM produced software. At that time, IBM was producing software. This was a one dimensional trim problem that uh, our engineers used for a while, but uh, uh, they felt it was clumsy, it was card oriented. Uh, written in SPS. This was a transportation problem that IBM wrote to simulate some transportation, uh, like the traveling salesman. Mm -hmm. This was a sort merge routine that IBM gave us um, to use, uh, and we did use it because I now notice we have uh, the original and, and a copy. And then over here was a routine that we ordered dealing with matrices and um, I know I didn't use it, somebody used it, but I can't remember offhand what it was. We're going to have to look at the documentation. Yeah, one of three, two of three, three yeah, of notice three. notice that? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, let's see. Now, we got tired of running the GoTran uh, interpreter by hand. And so this was an attempt by uh, one of our lab assistants, assistant Ed Liss, and another one by Perry Schmidt, to, when we got our disk, to go ahead and put the GoTran compiler slash interpreter on the disk drive, because IBM did not support that version, that, that method of processing, you follow me? GoTran is strictly card I.O. Right, they only did uh, Fortran 2D. That's right. So On disk. So the students, these were two of my brightest students, went ahead and they worked on it off and on for about a year or so, 
you can see this April 1973 is when he submitted this deck and got it working. So now students would use <coughs> the uh, a, a control card to bring the uh, GoTran compiler slash interpreter from the disk into the 1620 memory and then would mm -hmm. process their decks. Uh, fortunately, we had the GoTran <coughs> source decks that I, IBM furnished us for the card I.O. And this student, Perry Schmidt, key punched them from scratch. And so we, from like paper? Yeah, it, was, it was on paper, yeah. And he key punched them from scratch, and that's how we got this deck. And that's mm. how we were able to compile this version and get and it working. your version. Yeah, this was unique. Uh, IBM said that they would not do it because they had other things to do. We thought we could do it if we had the source, and we did it. And so this was our version of the uh, disk-oriented uh, GoTran compiler slash interpreter that we had. Now, did you, did any other, did this get distributed to any other sites, or did no, most sites no, just we, use we, Fortran No, we kept it here. We kept it here. Most of the other sites we used, were using Fortran. Some, some of them had abandoned Gotran, or if they were using Gotran, it's still the card I.O. Mm -hmm. So we kept it. So you can notice June 1973 and September 73, Ed List modified this, and then Perry Schmidt modified this, and I, I think the dates and close inside on the card. So that's what we did here. And, and we got more production. Okay. You'll notice over here, it says SIM 20. This is an IBM 360 simulator of the IBM 1620. You remember when I sent you the the, one, the, the two disk drives? Or oh, the disk packs? The disk packs. One dealt with the monitor operating system. The other dealt with the simulator of the 1620 on a 360 machine. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what IBM wrote... In, and this oh, is from IBM. This is from IBM. And what we did, we took the cards and loaded it on our IBM 360 um, Model 30 in those days. And uh, this was a humongous, these were, these were four trays. And so we were able on uh, an IBM 360 using the software here and the software down there, you notice there are four trays. Mm -hmm. We're able to simulate a 1620. I could take GoTran programs or SPS programs and run them on an IBM 360 using the simulator. Now, you've got the, the disk back, now you have the cards. Okay, you good. You see that? Now, the simulator, did it, at what level did it simulate the 1620? Okay, strictly from an application point of view. In other words, whatever... Um, at the machine instruction? It, or, yeah, well, every machine level, every machine instruction was, was simulated by the 360. So I could, uh, and I tested it, I tested uh, an SPS program using all the SPS instructions that I used in the past and it worked flawlessly. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So this is, these uh, decks can't even run today if you have an IBM 370, 380, 390, that under, because it's okay. machine code, you follow me? It's IBM assembler? Yeah, IBM assembler and machine code. Ah, okay. So we'll take a so look. It's, it's e so it could theoretically be run through a system today. That's right. To, to yeah, do I, that. I've never tested it. The last time we were working on these was in the mid 70s. And uh, we had uh, some tests. This was a test program that IBM furnished us that exercised it. And so we used this test program. So that's what I sent up to you guys uh, in January. So here's our system routines for the uh, 1620 some blank cards, some games, and then these are all contributed by the user group. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, these are the various classes, and rather than open the drawers, let me kind of give you the overview. Yeah, that's good. Uh, we, used to, we had a course called CIS 120 and CIS 131. We taught machine level language and SPS programming. And so in, the, in this card rack are student programs that worked in those days that I preserved. Uh, so these deal with the 1620 machine level language and SPS programming. Students who took Fortran took it under CIS 264. They did IBM 1620 Fortran, and so we have student programs preserved here, mm -hmm. as well as down here. That's good. And we have some statistics, and, and our stat class uh, used Fortran uh, uh, accordingly. Now for a while, remember I told you we use pretty damn quick Fortran? PDQ. Mm. Yes. So when we, we we had a course called IT65 and uh, that used it, so I preserved some of the decks there. So we have a history of some student programs that were used, and uh, students used an IBM supplied sorting routine on the 
on the 1620 and so we have some sorting uh, programs and data and, and decision tables that we're using here. I've got this in decision table software later. Compu CI CPT computer math uh, 122 used GoTran program for a while and so did uh, IT 10 and 12 introduction to data processing we used GoTran for a while so here are some GoTran decks that are preserved. Now uh, after using GoTran, people wanted to take their GoTran and run it to Fortran, convert it to Fortran. And so, since we had a ton of GoTran programs, we went ahead and wrote a GoTran to Fortran 2 translator. And so we have various versions, GoTran to Fortran 2, GoTran to Fortran 4, GoTran to Fortran 2, GoTran to Fortran 4 for various machines. This was for a Control Data 6500 that we had in Lafayette supercomputer mm -hmm. so it would run GoTran programs in the supercomputer but it would convert them to Fortran and we had an IBM 1620 40k version of that and then the rest now the for, when you say the 40k version that meant the uh, 40k it, referred to uh, 40k of memory 40,000 oh 40,000 digits. digits okay now if we, you had the memory expansion yeah, we didn't have that but there was a user in the area who had 40k and he says well let me let me take advantage of my 40k so we gave him uh, the GoTran to Fortran to translate the 40k version. So mm -hmm. as he gave us a copy of uh, that. All this, all the way down, is our card decks that supported the unit record equipment. Remember, key punches, 407. interpreters, 407s. All these are student oriented uh, card decks. And there's no need to look at them, they're, they're, they're self explanatory. Uh, so. Yeah, so if you had 085 collator, you need some problems, you use these 514, 085, and so on and so forth. All sorts of punch cards to mm -hmm. support the surrounding. Purple, okay. or unit record. Yeah. Now, here we have contributed programs from industry. We had people who worked in the industry came to school part-time, and after a while they would contribute programs. So, from American Maze, which is in Whiting, uh, they contributed an inventory control program uh, that was done in 16, on the 1620 Fortran. Okay, so uh, this did what they call EOQ and ROP computations, uh, strictly inventory control. So these two are from uh, American uh, Maze, so is this. And then these were contributed programs by other users outside, classroom utilization. Uh, there was a fellow named Steiner and another fellow named Spiroff that contributed programs. Now, on the six. Now, now, did these come through the user group or no, directly, directly to Purdue? These were people familiar with our program or had attended or knew of somebody. And okay. sometimes they'd say, you know, we don't have too many, too much business software uh, programs. You know, everything's academic or contributed. Or That's, mathematical. Yeah, yeah. mathematical. And somebody said, you know, we got an inventory control program at uh, Market Maze or we got a classroom utilization report. So they contributed it. Now over here, Elon Steele contributed a flowchart program, and somebody else in Escapes Me contributed a decision table program. In other words, you could take this program, feed it in, and then it will take your uh, source program, which was in Fortran, and flowchart it for you automatically. On the printer. On a printer using the 1620. Uh, this one dealt with decision tables. You would feed in some decision tables, and that would come some program. I didn't use that. Some of our staff members use uh, use these. I didn't use them. Uh, as you know, every installation generates mainless. So we had a variety of, of uh, programs oh, that generate mm -hmm. mainless. So here are some. And here's all there sorts of mailing mainless. There is mailing. several more. Yeah, all sorts. Uh, this this dealt with uh, 1620 users or people who had 1620s or people in the area. And then down here, you'll see benchmark programs. Uh, our students wrote benchmark programs either on the 1620 or some of the supporting equipment. Benchmark programs either did sorting or did solution of simultaneous linear equations or tested one of those algorithms like crop reduction or um, it, it just did something to eat time, primary mm -hmm. IO bond. And so here are some student programs that did that and I just kept them into there for a variety of machines. Okay, that's good. And, and these are right now blank because empty because I got to put those boxes in there and I haven't gotten time to okay. do that but it'll be done. So you got a snapshot of history on cards itself. And I think that's great. I think we need a break. 
Uh, and then I'm going to come back and we'll finish up here what we got. Okay. So let's take a short break and we'll go. And, and Dave tells me they're going to put plastic on these. Sober. Anyway, we went through this scenario and we said we got cards in the original punch cards. Uh, I wanted, I'm going to be giving Dave some books. This was a book by Professor Haig at our, Indi at our Purdue Indianapolis campus on comprehensive Fortran programming and it was for the 1620. So this, here's a Fortran book devoted strictly for the 1620 and uh, we used it. We used it for a number of years and so I'm going to contribute that with other books and as I told uh, in, in my recent email I indicated to them that uh, some books have a chapter, some books have an appendix, some books have a paragraph. I think that's valuable on the 1620. Mm -hmm. So I'll do that. I'm also going to contribute a paper dealing with our two-year and four-year computer technology programs at Purdue University. I wrote that paper and it was presented at the National Computer Conference in 1973. So this talks a little bit about our two-year okay, and four-year programs. Very good. And, and this will be stacked properly. Anyway, I've been going through my uh, books here, and I'm finding our Fortran 2 manuals and all sorts of other manuals, so you'll get copies. A lot of them have flow charts. That would be very good. Some of them have c code. Notice Fortran with format for the printer, option A. Remember, I was showing you those options there earlier, and here's the SPS listing to do these routines. So we've got the source code. Now, we also have the source code on cards, cards as well as the object. Okay, so what's interesting about this is you see the source code listed here, but you see the machine level language equivalent yeah, here, mm -hmm. and it's all the way through. So this is how the IBM documentation was transmitted to us or given to us. Sources, listings. listings. Okay, so if you go on and on, and if anybody knows this, uh, uh, how to read uh, SPS or read machine level language, you did a one-to-one -one comparison. Mm -hmm. So this is what I've Very been good. finding. Okay, and. Uh, And then I'm finding applications that were used. This is a reference dealing with index organization. Uh, we have a index routine there that produces a quick index and so on and so forth. So you guys are going to get all sorts of things. And then there's some talking about uh, companies that used uh, these computers, John Hancock. Oh, Mitchell. excellent. So we'll give you what, what, what they're worth and we'll go from there. So this is what I've got and I'm, I'm finding these. And last night when I was here, I uncovered this box up here, and I haven't gone through it completely. But there's a ton of 1620 manuals. Remember the linear programming system, the LP? Mm -hmm. Well, here's the documentation that goes with it. The PERT. That we had a PERT thing in there. Oh, see, so these yeah. are all this. all 1620 stuff. Look at that stuff. 1620 monitor one. Uh, and some are duplicates, which is fine. But mm -hmm. well, what I'm saying to you, there's a ton of uh, here 1620, 1710 programs, catalog of programs. Oh, very nice. You follow me? Yeah. Catalog of all programs that was produced by IBM in April of '69 for both 1620 and 1710 systems. And this goes on and on. So there's a whole slew of funny routines here that I completely forgot. That should keep us busy for a couple of weekends. Yeah. At least. Yeah, I want to put them in some sort of order, maybe by numeric sequence here, by these serial mm -hmm. numbers. Uh, 1620 SPS for card I.O. and additional core storage. 1620 subroutine specs. Well, we have the subroutines over there. Mm -hmm. 16. 10, 17, 10 SPS system. SPS. Here's a uh, listing of all program names, the IBM order number, the version number, the mod level, and the modification date. date. Look at that. And the check marks indicate what I've got here. Oh, excellent. So here's Fortran with format for cards. Here's Gotran for cards. Here's 1620, 1311 monitor, one system card. And this was version 1, mod level 10. As you know, I've got 3 and 12 over there. Right. And mod level 10 was released uh, 3565. Mm-hmm. Okay. So this, this is how this stuff goes on and on. 
some uh, that looks like some marketing marketing or, which okay that that would be excellent to have yeah. that also uh, something about engineering and plotting something about 1620 in engineering science oh, optics, optics petroleum. petroleum this was 1620 was heavily used in petroleum gas public gas utilities that's where that guy developed PDP this is uh, some kind of little brochure oh, here. that's a little guy ah remember like him? a pocket guy the pocket guy yeah. yeah I'm gonna go through that uh, all sorts of things Oh, this is great. 1621 oh, dimensional program. Yeah. Trim. Okay. Remember that trim program? Mm -hmm. Reference card. Statistics. This thing goes on and on. I haven't even gone through that, but this, 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 look how deep this is, the, the documentation. You follow me? And I haven't gone through but I will go before it's shipped out. Okay? So Even if you don't have time to go through mm -hmm. and just catalog everything, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if you don't have it done by Thursday, that's fine also. Okay, I'll put it, but I, but I still want to put in some logical order. Right. And uh, then I'm giving some books that we use at one time where the 1620 is mentioned, or there's an appendix. Mm -hmm. So I think you, the museum should have some of these because uh, you got to remember uh, uh, there are a lot. There were the two primary equipment was 1620 and 141 at that era in 61, right. 62, 63, 64. Here's yeah, a guy these for are prepared. in great condition too. So here's a key punch. key punch. Here's the punch card. Oh, excellent! Ninety column univac. Oh, that's card. a univac, univac card. card. With the round, yeah, uh, with round holes. Square. Yeah. So a little bit, little things like that is important. Here's a mm -hmm. uh, the advac. <laughs> so excellent. So, this is all really yeah, good. The, yeah, you guys should have that because if you're going to have the six and twenty, you need the frame of mind of when it was used. You need. Uh, the surroundings, the environment, that, the environment and, uh, that it went, and how students did data processing, and this is a snapshot of how it took place. Well, not just students too, because a lot of the information in there looks like um, industry-wise, how IBM was positioning the system, you know, for use in in science, exactly. industry, uh, exactly. petroleum yeah. industry. Right. Uh, so we'll do that, and we'll go from there, and. Uh, the, although these manuals are loose, I had my secretary come up with some binders and we'll put them in here because okay. they all got three holes. So hopefully they won't be scattered when you, when they arrive. You guys could use them. So I haven't gone through all of these, and, but we will. Okay. And uh, what else do I have? Yeah. Any. Uh, it's it's like the important thing to capture is uh, things that are in your head also yeah. well, that are are not written down, yeah, which is. Uh, more videotaping this, but uh, Babka said I should come out there and dump my thoughts into a what a voice response system. <laughs> I don't have time, but when I do come, they could have a voice response system. Right. I'll do that. So we'll do that when we get some time when I get out there. But anyway, that gives you a snapshot of this room. And as I said, I had boxes stacked nearly to the ceiling and all the way there, and I had to remove them, take them off site. So. I think uh, what we should do then is get ready, if you like. Yeah. We'll go off-site. We'll see. We don't have punch cards off-site. We have uh, manuals, Manual books. Manuals, documentation. Uh, similar to this, but in greater detail. Okay. Uh, like, similar to this, I also have, at the other place, the rack that resided on the 1620 with, uh, with some of the unit record document. manuals. Remember, we surrounded right. the equipment. So we'll do that. So okay. why don't we? Uh, that sounds very good. Get ready for that scenario, and this will all be cleaned up by Thursday, uh, this coming week, and uh, this will be. Go no? okay. Okay. In these uh, trays, you'll notice we have some additional games. We have our baseball simulation routines. Uh, in both scenarios, uh, uh, these were from the 1620 users group. Uh, this is a simulation program. It has about 50 old-time baseball players. You pick nine uh, team members. The computer picks nine team members, and they play against each other using a random number generator. This is a fun type of game, using, of course, the uh, typewriter as the output. We have a bunch of musical music generators, and uh, you'll notice uh, this is a musical generator assembly program and some output programs. There's some instructions. And these, together with the General Motors Institute, which is another musical generator, these were obtained from the 1620 Users Group, and these can play music for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have used these musical programs in the past, including this and this. And down here is a perfect number 
generator here is a perpetual calendar. I don't know if it's your 2K compliant. Maybe when you guys run it, you can tell <laughs> We can them. test that out. <laughs> See if it's your 2K compliant. So here's your music. A ton of this stuff wow, that great. you generate, and also baseball. Let me see what I got underneath that. Oh, these are test scoring routines. Uh, we used, uh, we set on Tennessee Tech, but we for a while we looked at Northeastern University's uh, test scoring program and uh, Tennessee Tech, and one more, but we set on Tennessee Tech. And this is a Gregorian calendar. Notice 1585 to 2599. I don't know if that's your 2K compliant. We'll have to tell the authors if it's not. Yes. <laughs> we would like a fix for that, please. Fix. <laughs> so these are some additional games down here, but the music uh, program should help you accordingly. Okay, great. Okay. I'm going to start it. Let me back up. Or no, you can get, you can catch it out. Let me go. 73. Okay. There's our logo. Purdue University Calumet. Mm hmm. Welcome. And this building here was the one that the 1620 was, in here. was housed in. 1246, 74 degrees. And that's the gate building. That we were at. The gate building. And I'll start in. Okay, that. And so this is the gate building where the, the, the annex. The annex. Oh, the, the annex. annex. Yeah. And this is where Inland Steel had their 1620 also. Okay, so Inland Steel. That's part of the, of the building. Uh, okay. A rack that sat on the 1620 computer and it had a lot of manuals, especially the unit record manuals, key punches, collators, sorters, etc. And we also have another complement of unit record literature. Remember, the unit the record literature supported the punch card processing. Uh -huh. These are books that were out at that time, some devoted to the 1620 exclusively, others mentioning it, and I'm going through it and giving these. This was a popular uh, math book that was used by our campus at one time, and uh, they had uh, talked uh, of this book, IBM 1620, etc., so they were mentioning it, so I thought I'd toss these yeah, in. Yeah, that would be great. I'm not using them at, at all. and. Uh, uh, I've, I've got to go through those boxes to see if there's any other manuals and or books. This is all the common stuff. This is the common organization, the user group. And uh, this was their administrative manual. And I went through this oh, the other day. Oh, that would be excellent. And Look I found myself, those. I found Purdue University Calumet Campus, and I had a user number of 3323. Interesting, 3323 Purdue University Calumet. Here are all the installations, government agencies, universities, uh, uh, industry, uh, etc., who had 1620s. And so this is a list of folks that had 1620s. 1620s. Who were, who had, so who knows if they've got one left in the basement? And I wanted to find out who was representing uh, user 3323 and user 33. 23 is Dr. John Maniotis, yours truly. So here I am. And that was the Purdue University, Purdue University in Indiana. Indiana. So there it was. But it gives names of other people. For example, Lanny Hoffman represented the University of South Dakota. He did a lot of work on the 1620. We have some of those contributed programs. Mm -hmm. So this is how you will find. Now, is any others. of this information on punch cards or in electronic format, or is it just uh, printed out? This in is this? printed out, uh, the okay. majority of this, yeah. Uh, what you saw in punch cards today is what I have. Okay. okay. That's it. So this is the bylaws of the 1620, how meetings were organized. Uh, a little bit about uh, how the various divisions, there was a systems division, a little bit about management division, administrative division. Oh, that's division. excellent. So this is how Commons first got organized, and uh, I think it's important they know this. Today, as you know, Common primarily is an AS400 um, user organization, mm -hmm. and also an RS6000, so it really has nothing to do with the 1620. And uh, here in th these boxes are all the 1620 user proceedings. This took place in Oklahoma in November 1964, and they list what happened in the proceedings, 
and if possible, they have flow charts and computer programs that were either donated or talked about at that particular proceeding. And as you go through this list from 1964 up to the 70s, they get progressively thicker. Here's 1620 users, New York, October 1965. Look how thick this guy is. Oh, yeah. And a lot of contributions, a lot of talks were given uh, about the 1620, and uh, a lot of software applications were discussed. And so you can see as you funnel through some of these, and they also have flow charts and all sorts of logic diagrams and so forth. And so this box starts with the early days of the 1620 users group. The next box, next part here, which was in the box and I took out, starts with the 1620, 1968, and for a while they started to get thicker and thicker and thicker. Okay. And as we go through here, we are now into the 1970s, and we have some preliminary agendas that were distributed. Here was the 1620 users group, but it was named Common. So now we start talking about Common. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, this was a meeting held in St. Louis, Missouri, April 1970. And then another one held in December of 71 in Los Angeles. So these are strictly the agenda, and now we're getting, you know, pretty thick in comparison to that. And then they started getting a little more formal. They started binding these, and here's the um, common user proceedings, 71, December 71 LA. in Los Angeles, and it goes on and on. Okay, so what you're seeing now is the 70s, and here now they talk about a little bit about the 1620, but they start going to the 1130. The 360. So here's the papers that started switching. And now okay. magnetic tape services for the IBM 1130. So it starts now to expand shift. and shift. And uh, let's see if I can catch any more. Yeah, it's starting to shift. And the 1620 is starting to diminish a little bit here. So that's what's happening in terms of the transition. Very yeah. good. Excellent. We also have here, uh, they're buried in there. IBM had another product called the IBM 1800. Yes, like real-time uh, process real -time. control. So machine. they started coming into common as the 1620 started to shift down. So we have 1620, 1130, 1800, and then the IBM Series 3, the System 3 starts coming in. Mm -hmm. And then eventually the System 3 evolves to the System 32, the 36, the 38. System 38, and into the AS400, and out, phase out 1620, the 1130, the 1800, they all get phased out. So that's what's saying, but common survives. Right. So, and their roots are from the 1620 users group. Ah, very interesting. Yeah, that? That, yes. And, and it's documented historically in here, too. So there is uh, historical documentation on this. And. Uh, point out one thing here, if I could find it. Okay, in this green book, Common Reference Manual, the history of the organization is explained. Now, this was done in October of 68, okay, and so it starts talking about its roots, when it was created in January of 61, and who some of the people were. And one of the prominent individuals mentioned is what they told me, Dr. Jan Lee, from Canada. He started the mm -hmm. one up in Canada, and he's contributed a lot here. So you can read about the history, and it has several pages about it. And it lists all the meetings mm -hmm. of the 1620 users from April of 1961 all the way through 65, all the way to when they stopped. 69. The 69. But as you know, some of these were in the 70s. But this thing was pu published in, in 68. Okay. I, didn't, I never got the, the updates to that, so this is as far as mine goes. But you and have a the good number history. of attendees and so forth. Yeah, yeah, look, yeah. At, the, look at the attendees. In fact, uh, the first meeting look had at 170. Yeah, 170, and then where it starts picking up is starting in 64. It starts picking up. And uh, 66, 
New Orleans in 66. This was a joint meeting, 549. Cincinnati, 855. So you can see how it started to pick up and then gradually go down. So a lot of history here. A lot. Okay, so you guys good have, history. Now you guys can have this. And as I said, all of this is 1620 users slash Oh, comment. this is excellent. Okay, now, remember where all the punch cards were that I showed you today? Right. Okay. Every punch card deck also came with documentation, which I need to put in order. For example, here's simultaneous equations, uh, equation solution matrix inversion. This was the software 9.4015. Mm -hmm. There should and be a copy. The deck will be labeled. Label. Label. Have that label. And if you, if we glance in here. It will tell you who the authors were, who the program is, gives you a little bit about the key. They submitted an object deck, a source deck, and a test deck. Okay. And then they talk a little bit about the theory. The algorithm. The and algorithm. So forth. Okay. So, and then they talk about the input data and they give the code. Now, this was done in Fortran, so the source code is also listed here. They also give uh, the outputs. And then they go on for some more uh, code. So what you see in all these manuals is source code, in sample inputs, sample outputs. Here's the 1620 linear programming. Remember? Card mm -hmm. I.O. Okay. And again, same scenario here. In, okay. some, in some cases, they even gave you the flow chart so you could follow the logic. Okay, so what I'm saying to you is... Uh, you got the details behind the punch cards. So we should have one of these documents for each one of those, those. decks that's in there. Yeah, and sometimes you may have a document, but not the source code. But at least you got the, I'm sorry, not the punch card deck, but you at least got the source code on uh, paper. Right, in, in the okay. document. And uh, over here, my secretary, uh, Mrs. Frida Anderson, printed for me all the programs that we had at Purdue uh, Checkmark said we have cards, and Astra said we have duplicates. So all these check marks mean we have them, but we also have duplicates with the asterisk. You see that? Mm -hmm. So oh, there's snowball in there. Yeah, snowball. You have a snowball for the yeah. snowball three. Sure, sure. Did you know snowball was there? No. Uh, now I uh, supposedly I've got the cards. Well, I should have the documentation. Let's see what else was in here. Uh, there's the crowd reduction, which I showed you mm -hmm. earlier. Uh, Moses. Uh, polynomial curve yeah. fitting. Here's yeah. all the statistics. Polynomial curve fitting. Random number generator. The plot routine I showed you. Uh -huh. uh, adiabatic flame temperature I showed you. Multi-curve, 1620. Linear programming I showed you. Yeah, a lot of linear. Linear programming. PERT I showed you. Critical and critical path. path I showed you. Yep. All this is critical path. And notice the check marks. We have them. And then... Uh, the quick index I showed you there. We have right. tic tac toe. Tic tac toe. Perpetual calendar that I showed you. Baseball game. Uh, there's the game of dice. Uh, here, General Motors Institute music program that I showed you, and the baseball game. Musical outputs. The Gregorian calendar, which you'll check for your 2000 your compliance. Compliance, yes. The plot uh, routine. Uh, how to teach Fortran. Uh, the 141, this is a 1401 simulator, I think. I, don't, I think. I didn't use it. Here's the University of Mississippi's test scoring program. Uh, I showed you that. Um, then it says, I need manuals for the following, which means I got the decks, but not the manuals. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this index will be on top. Of the documentation. Of the documentation. And I'm going to put them in the, see those binders? I'm going to put them in those binders yeah. somehow. And that way they won't move out, so to speak, okay? And we'll be able to locate it pretty yeah. easily. Yeah. So when we're cataloging. Yeah. Oh, let's talk about the simulator, the 1620, the 360 simulator that simulated okay. the 1620. Here's my letter that started this. I got a flyer from uh, Professor Lanny Hoffman at the University of South Dakota. I have received your flyer concerning the 1620 users meeting at Kansas City April 7, 1971, and unfortunately I will not be able to attend. However, 
I would like a preprint of the article by Breyer and William, a 360 simulator for the 1620. We have a 20K 1620 Model 1 with a 1443 printer and a 1311 disk storage drive. We would like to use a simulator if it's possible. Well, one thing led to another, and he referred me to somebody in IBM, and I got it, is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. and so this was the letter that went out. And uh, a mimeographed uh, here, a 360 th simulator. simulator for the 1620 by Byron Williams, a rather good system for teaching 360 and a 360BL machine 40 or 60K. Okay, and then there was some Very more. Nice. Yeah, so you got you got a lot of history here, is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, we'll put it in order and go from there. Uh, What else we got in here? Let's take a look. First 1620 GUI interface. Did you know that? No. I'm kidding you. I thought I'd do that to make your day. <laughs> so, okay, I want to see. No, you want to see it. Sorry, yeah, boys. And uh, where, where's that Java interpreter <laughs> for the 1620? <laughs> Okay. I heard you had to have the core expansion for the job for the, and the right heaters. The temperature had to be yes, right. Yes, and the right heaters <laughs> on the core, too. So, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, now, I just found this box uh, the other day. I got a ton of manuals here. Uh, notice these are from IBM. Okay? Mm -hmm. And it indicates uh, the IBM number and so forth. Uh, and it's from the 1620 library that IBM had. And this is for a general ray trace and third order aberrations program. Right? So optics. Uh, optics of some sort. And so here's all the code that he had. This was then in SPS. Okay. And so uh, we picked it up. Here's all the logic, the flowcharts behind it. So you could go through this. And uh, here's the descriptions. Mm -hmm. And uh, sample input, sample output. So, you know, there's a ton of software here. Oh. You follow me? Ton of yeah. software. And there's the optics. Yeah. So what we're saying is... Uh, uh, this is everything. Everything. Just about. Let's see. I'm, I'm going to skip around and pick up some interesting ones. There. Da 1620 da drafting system. Dave, Dave, are you getting all this? Yes. <laughs> uh, look at a drafting system. You needed a plotter, of course. Mm -hmm. But we didn't have a plotter, but that was all right. The, the, this is a, a thick thing. Oh, so this whole box is just full, full of all yeah, these Yeah, manuals. yeah. Would you think I had three or four? I got, I got over Everything. 100. <laughs> when you get this, give me a final count. I don't know. Oh, I, mean, I am going to send you a copy of the would tape. You, uh, yeah, would you? Okay. Yeah. And uh, just bouncing through, uh, here's the 1620 Monitor 2 system. Remember there was a Model uh, 2? Yes. That ran. That was a, the monitor was similar but different than the mod, monitor one. I, monitor one. The stuff I have is a monitor for monitor one. You follow me? I don't have monitor two two uh, source programs, but I've got the manual for this, and uh, you guys could uh, peruse it and see what the differences were. And, and that was the same like uh, the Fortran two D yeah, uh, yeah. and so forth. so forth. So take a look at that stuff. Uh, let, me get, let me see if I got any interesting ones here. I was just trying to think how long it's going to take Dag to uh, catalog all these new materials. That well, he's 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 going to be a busy good. boy for a while. He's good. He's yeah, good. he's good. Uh, hey, here. Original equipment manufacturers IBM 16 1622 card read punch. Some of the specs. Oh, uh, now that would have been what uh, you some were telling me yeah. when we took a coke break. Yeah. Uh, how Honeywell, uh, Honeywell would use this, use this 1622 two, card reader punch and, on and their OEM on their things on their, they, their machines. Yeah, all they did was change the color of the skins. That's all they did. And they just used the guts from IBM. That's it. Yeah. So what I'm saying is we got a ton of documentation here. Uh, remember these guys? These are yeah, coding you were sheets. Telling me about that when we were going through yeah. the original. Uh, so our students uh, would buy these SPS. and code in SPS in assembly level language. If we made them code in machine level language, which we did, they'd use the reverse side. So notice this is the absolute system, 1610. Mm -hmm. So they coded in machine language. They had to put the location, the opcode, both the mnemonic and the numeric, the P and Q address, and any comments, and then they key punched us. Okay, after they finished that, they went into SPS. And then uh, these are from other systems. Uh, 360 RPG. Yeah, but you knew we had an RPG compiler, didn't you, on the 1620? No. I'm just kidding you. <laughs> but 
<laughs> okay, this is 360. <laughs> uh, but uh, we had uh, yeah, 360 assembler. an assembler. Yeah. So I found it. I'm with those. I don't need those. Yeah, I mean, those would be just yeah. good also. Listen. Remember these guys? A little green Yes. Things? Okay, this was a... Uh, this was a uh, little marketing slash engineering brochure that they would pass out to prospective clients. And it kind of summarized in a thumbnail sketch about the 1620 Model 1 and the Model 2 and some of the features uh, that were available. So I found these. Uh, as yeah, I actually, I don't recall us having a lot of that material, especially these brochures that, 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 that we've gotten. Yeah. So we, we've gotten stuff from the IBM archives or copies uh, from the IBM archives. I don't recall also, that at all. in the box was the 1130, so I'll toss that in. Uh, we'll take that even yeah. though it's... And uh, System uh, 360 Model 20, we had also this on mm -hmm. campus. The Model 25, we did not have the Model 25. The Model 44, we were going to buy it, but things didn't work out, so we didn't have it, but we had some literature. But we did have an IBM uh, System 360 Model 30 on campus, so mm -hmm. here's the specs. Here's about teleprocessing equipment, nice uh, little thin brochure. Here's the IBM System 3. Ah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then there's some rep repetition. Here's the 360 Model yeah. 25. Like, they, they were out of order. But anyway, we'll we'll put them uh, in an appropriate order so you could. Uh, that will be get very these. good. Excellent. Okay. Now this stuff. Uh, here's uh, another yeah, yeah, customer. Yeah. Yeah. Here's uh, some customers who had uh, IBM equipment, and so uh, some testimonials, and uh, we'll put them mm -hmm. in here. This stuff here got out of order, and I got to put it in order. This is the systems manual for the 16, 20, 13, 11. ADT, APT processor. This is the uh, uh, right here. Numerical control processor. Did you know this was a numerical control machine? 1710. Yeah, yeah. So this is all the documentation of that, and it fell out of order. And I got to put it in, in order, but and I'm almost there. So okay, good. So I'll get it in order, and we'll go accordingly. So again. Uh, more 1620 stuff, more Fortran stuff, Fortran two, and so forth. So, all sorts of documentation on this table. I had not gotten through all that. Before. And all those boxes back over in the corner yeah. that I'm taking a picture of right now yeah. have documentation. Yeah. Now, uh, there, there, I'm sure there's some 1620 stuff in there, but I'm, I also am sure, uh, because uh, I looked at some of the titles earlier, that there's some digital VAX stuff in there. Mm -hmm. There's some digital uh, TOPS 10 and TOPS 20 stuff because we use some of the uh, equipment at that time uh, elsewhere. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to go through that and I got to go through this. These are magazines and I got to do a quick shot just to see if any specific uh, magazines mention of that mention the 1620. So we need to go through that. Let me put the light on here. Okay. Okay, we got that. So we need to go through these. Uh, I don't expect too much here, but that will be primarily the area and this table. Okay, good. This is excellent. Do you have any of this at the museum? I don't recall seeing that, and especially some of the marketing materials. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. I do know, the thing that I actually remember getting from the IBM archive folks is... Um, we have some photographs that were taken of the 16 to like marketing type yeah, photographs. Yeah, I, I, I don't have photographs. Uh, uh, that type of yeah, thing. Yeah, you mean the glossies? Glossies, yeah. yeah. That's good. Yeah, I don't have any glossies. And more internal type uh, mm -hmm. information. Okay. IBM internal okay. type information. Okay. This will be excellent. This will yeah. be, it's almost, it's overwhelming. <laughs> Just to did, see did it. Did I meet your expectations? No, you did not meet our did expectations. I surpass them? You surpassed them. You blew them away. <laughs> <laughs> They're <just> vaporized. <laughs> I just wondered. <laughs> and I'm sure I'm not going to be the. I'm not the only one that's. This is great. Now, would this you is, like to see the real 1620 in my garage? Dave, would you like to see the real 1620? <laughs> I wish I did. I wish I did. Yeah. yeah. I told him the story. If I was not sick, we could have had it in my garage, but yeah. uh, I couldn't make it uh, for. There might be there. one in somebody's garage, garage somewhere and, and that. We'll use it, but I, I, if I was well, I would have had it in my garage. And so the next stop after this would have been my garage. Yep. And it would have been the 1620 CPU Model 1, the card read, card punch, the disk storage drive, and the printer. 
That would have been a nice system. And it would have been working. Yes. That would have been nice. But we're working on it's that. Good to, it's good to daydream a little bit about that. Yes. <laughs> anyway, okay. So that's what I got to do between now and Thursday. Thursday.